Exciting times are coming. Imagine that Starship successfully reaches orbit. What's next? Blue Origin wants to buy ULA? Is Virgin Galactic doomed? My name is Felix, welcome to What About It. Let's dive right in. Starship updates. Great to have you back. We're making this episode as it's a very interesting topic and we just can't predict if Starship has launched already. There could be a few reasons as to why. Perhaps a scrub or a lack of the necessary launch license. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to look into the future yet. Hopefully the rocket is still in one piece and the launch is around the corner or Starship near Hawaii. Fortunately, the threat of a government shutdown has dissipated, which means that even if the license hadn't been issued by the time of this video's release, we shouldn't expect a long delay due to everything shutting down. Hopes are high that this second Starship launch will give SpaceX more data to work with in the long run. This, however, raises an interesting question. What will follow a successful Starship launch? What is next? Starship reaching orbit is the big milestone, not just as proof of the rocket's capabilities, but also as a catalyst for unlocking previously closed gates. A successful launch will effectively greenlight future missions as no investigations and assessments would be needed for the next launches. This could lead to a more regular launch schedule. While a launch every few days is a distant reality right now, aiming for over five Starship missions in 2024 seems feasible, assuming we don't see another rocket tornado. Furthermore, a successful mission would significantly advance plans for launches from Florida's LC-39A. Last year, SpaceX constructed an almost complete orbital launch integration tower or OLED there and began installing a water deluge system. However, work stalled due to the Starship's first launch delays. Currently, progress is on hold for two main reasons. Firstly, there is a need to validate the design, determining whether the current one is viable or if Starship requires massive changes. NASA is the second reason for the pause of work at LC-39A. As this launch complex is currently the only active human launch site in the US, NASA has insisted on an operational backup site and a demonstration of Starship's safety before allowing any testing there. This backup site issue has recently been resolved with the addition of a launch tower at Slick 40, a development we covered in more detail in the previous episode. After Starship successfully reaches orbit, we can expect work to resume not only at LC-39A, but also at the Roberts Road facility. At this location, close to Kennedy Space Center, SpaceX has built a star factory akin to the one at Starbase. However, right now nothing is being constructed there, pending the success of Starship's orbital flight. Once operations kick off again, we might see the rise of a mega bay there. Interestingly, parts for such a bay were initially at Roberts Road, but SpaceX later relocated them to Boca Chica, leading to the creation of Mega Bay 2. Further expansion of Roberts Road is also expected, as the environmental review for its extension is nearing completion. Moving operations to Florida should accelerate testing, given that SpaceX won't face the same logistical hurdles as in Texas. These include no launch on Sundays or the need to close public roads for rollouts. Launching from Florida also offers flights over the ocean for safety and more efficient flight trajectories. Thanks to being closer to the equator, less fuel is required to achieve desired orbits as Earth's rotation makes things easier. Moreover, operating a launch site in close proximity to international borders, like the current setup near the Mexican border, poses long-term challenges, especially if a launch doesn't go as planned. Relocating launches to Florida could mitigate these concerns, making for smoother and safer launches in the future. LC-39A is naturally just one of several potential sites for future Starship launches. In 2021, SpaceX considered constructing a new launch complex, LC-49, designed exclusively for Starship operations. 
This would take some pressure off LC-39A, ensuring it's available for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. However, building a new launch complex is a significant undertaking, potentially requiring a year or two to complete if SpaceX decides to proceed with this plan. A fully successful Starship launch would also pave the way for future developments at its home starbase. We've actually already received some insights into the mission following a successful orbit. The third Starship launch is set to include a powered soft landing, an essential test of the ship's ability to reignite its engines after re-entry. This would mark a critical step towards the eventual goal of catching the ship using Mechazilla's arms. Yep, they are still planning to do this. Before this ambitious form of recovery is attempted, SpaceX plans to focus on catching the booster first. Elon Musk is pretty confident of their ability to do this, mainly thanks to landing experience with Falcon 9. He anticipates that they might catch the Super Heavy booster after just a few missions with a successful recovery expected sometime next year. Successfully achieving orbit will also likely motivate SpaceX to start adding payloads to their Starship missions. The current bottleneck in the Starlink constellation, mainly due to the Falcon 9's limited capacity, shows the importance of Starship. With its significantly larger payload to orbit and bigger base, Starship could deploy the full-sized V2 Starlinks, greatly improving the network's throughput and bringing the constellation to the next level. This may be a turning point for Starlink, as even with just Falcon 9, it's predicted to become one of the most profitable projects for SpaceX. Ship 28 is currently the earliest prototype capable of launching the Starlink V2s it will likely take to the skies after Ship 25. All prototypes up to Ship 32 feature pes style payload bays, meaning that SpaceX isn't planning to launch consumer satellites anytime soon. However, we can eventually expect to see a new design for payload bay doors, one that can accommodate the release of larger, non-flat satellites. As SpaceX's operations accelerate in the future, the launch towers at Boca Chica and Florida might not be enough for their growing launch schedule. To address this, SpaceX may consider adding a second launch tower at Starbase right next to the existing one. This expansion has been a part of their plans for a long time, as can be seen in numerous SpaceX renders. While the company currently needs to submit additional documents to the Army Corps of Engineers, there is nothing preventing them from doing so and expanding their facilities. They even have a spare tower at Roberts Road, so that a new tower could be up and running in a matter of months. NASA officials also said that Starship reaching orbit is a pivotal milestone for the Human Landing System program. Some significant Raptor tests have been conducted at the McGregor facility, but the flights are what counts most for HLS. Before the Artemis 3 mission, NASA's first crewed lunar landing since Apollo, the American Space Agency expects to see 15 to 17 Starship test flights. After all, to get a lunar ship to the moon, several tankers will be needed, meaning that by that point, the Starship has to be incredibly reliable. Not to mention the fact that SpaceX will also have to master orbital refueling, something that was never done before at this scale. Transferring liquids on Earth is relatively straightforward, thanks to gravity and pumps. In space, however, this task becomes significantly more complex due to the weightlessness of liquids in fuel tanks. For in-orbit refueling, two ships will need to dock together, a task that, while not easy, has been accomplished many times. For a large vehicle like Starship, the most viable method of transferring propellant will likely involve using thrusters and pressure systems to create a form of artificial gravity, forcing the liquid to one side of the tank. Given the timeline for Artemis 3, we could expect to see such a test conducted in the coming months. One thing is certain, following a successful orbit by Starship, whether on its second or fifth attempt, the pace of development will go absolutely crazy. What do you think we'll see first, Starship fuel transfer demo or the deployment of a first batch of V2 Starlinks? Place your bets in the comments! Shifting our attention to the build site, we start at the familiar High Bay, where Ship 30 is nearly ready to move to the Massey's test site. 
Images captured by our Ycam operator John indicate that most of the lifting points have been covered with tiles. That is a good sign. It seems the only remaining area requiring tiles is around the aft flaps, but that should be patched up shortly. Before heading to the Sanchez site, let's briefly look at the Star Factory. Here the installation of the front wall cladding is nearly finished. However, there is still no indication of any glass for the building, so it seems that the Star Factory will simply remain a large white block without any option to see what's happening inside. So basically the same we have right now. Upon arriving at our destination near the Rocket Garden, we're greeted by a towering structure. It is not a launch tower, it's an air separation unit. This piece of equipment is designed to break down the surrounding air into its primary components, mainly oxygen and nitrogen. This construction has been one of the longest standing at Starbase and only recently it was finally dismantled. But why? While as far as we are aware, SpaceX did utilize this unit to extract oxygen and nitrogen, the amount produced was relatively small compared to their massive requirements. To put things in perspective, a simple scrub requires hundreds of tankers filled with oxygen, nitrogen and methane. A tanker or even 10 doesn't really make a difference. The future of this unit and whether SpaceX plans to scale up its propellant production remains uncertain. What are your thoughts on SpaceX's potential to create its own propellant? Share your opinions in the comments. Here's a little task for you. YouTube might have unsubscribed you without knowledge. Not kidding. They seem to do this frequently. Very important task. Double check that subscribe button so that you don't miss our updates. While checking, hit the like button and consider becoming a wise supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including orbital, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. The next flyover will likely happen on the day you watch this episode. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access, you decide what you want to give. Check our new website as well, launch previews, road closures, the latest weather reports and our multi-stream viewer, whataboutit.space. The link to our Patreon page and the new website is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams for our team, we can't thank you enough, you rock! While we're lost in thought about the marvels of Starship, let's shift our focus to something a tad more immediate. The eerie way the internet seems to have an uncanny insight into our lives, wouldn't you agree? Ever been bothered by those persistent spam emails or startled by how some websites just seem to know you too well? This happens when certain cunning entities on the internet track every click you make and are selling your information to data brokers. Now imagine having a digital guardian angel to shield you. Introducing our sponsor Incogni, your knight in digital armor, banishing robocalls, unsolicited emails and intrusive targeted ads from your virtual realm. Ensuring your private information remains just that, private, while swiftly dealing with any online nuisance. It's essentially like having a best friend in the digital world. Incogni will save you all of the hassle of reaching out to data brokers yourself, which can take years. Incogni will do it all on your behalf and even getting started is easy. Sign up, grant Incogni the reins and watch as they weave their magic. They even provide progress reports to keep you in the loop. And the first 100 people to use promo code FELIX at incogni.com slash FELIX will get a huge 60% off instead of 20. Join Incogni today and take control of your digital journey. Particularly your privacy and help what about it at the same time incogni.com slash felix returning to the latest news in the space industry we have updates from spacex's primary competitor united launch alliance in one of our previous episodes we discussed a design flaw in the vulcan centaur rocket which necessitated the de-stacking of the vehicle that was basically ready for its inaugural flight the upper stage was sent back to decatur alabama for repairs there, it underwent a thorough insulation removal process after which its forward dome was replaced with a newly reinforced one. This entire refurbishment took several months, but by November 5th, the now fixed Centaur 5 was loaded onto ULA's colossal rocket ship for its transport to Cape Canaveral. Meanwhile, the Vulcan booster was installed at the vertical integration facility. This was quickly followed by the arrival of the interstage on November 8th, which by now should be installed. 
Fast forward to November 13th, the rocket ship which transports parts for both the Atlas V and Vulcan Centaur rockets reached its destination. The following steps will involve a quick inspection and installation of the upper stage onto the Vulcan booster, finalizing the rocket's main assembly. Before the launch, we can anticipate some form of pressure testing to confirm that everything is leak free. The mission's primary payload is the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander, a compact lunar lander designed to deliver around 100 kilograms to the moon's surface. ULA's confidence in their yet-to-be-flown Vulcan rocket is impressive, especially considering that usually inaugural launches end with a failure. That said, ULA's track record with the Atlas V, which successfully reached orbit on its first launch, gives me some confidence that they can do it. Initially, the payload was also set to include two prototypes of Amazon's Kuiper satellite, a direct competitor to Starlink. However, these were launched on an Atlas V due to delays, so we don't know whether this flight will include more Kuipers. The much-anticipated launch of Vulcan is currently scheduled for December 24th. Perhaps it will aid Santa in delivering presents on time. Despite numerous delays in the first mission, ULA CEO Tori Bruno has shared a picture indicating that things may escalate after the inaugural launch. Inside the Decatur facility where this first mission's upper stage was repaired, work is already underway on four additional Centaur 5s. Additionally, ULA is taking huge steps towards making Vulcan partially reusable in the future. Now you might wonder, partially reusable? How does that work without landing legs? Who said anything about landing legs? What do you think is one of the most expensive components of a rocket? If you guessed the engines, you are right on the money. ULA's own data shows that engine costs represent about 65% of the total first stage cost for the Atlas V. As a side note, the enormous quantities of fuel and oxidizer the rocket's propellants are relatively inexpensive. Given the high cost of engines, it's not surprising that many aerospace companies are considering various recovery methods. ULA's unique approach involves a modular aft section for Vulcan housing the two BE-4 engines. After completing their role in the flight, this section would detach from the booster and re-enter the atmosphere shielded by an inflatable heat shield. Following this, it would deploy a parachute, and then a recovery helicopter would snag the engines in mid-air. This fascinating method bypasses the complexity of propulsive landing, focusing instead on salvaging the most valuable components, the engines. The heat shield for the SMART project has been successfully tested, and recently they've even conducted a full-scale drop test with engine simulators, proving that this approach may work. However, the future of this recovery method actually being used remains uncertain as ULA is about to be sold. Yeah, you heard me right. ULA is currently owned by Lockheed Martin and Boeing, each holding a 50% stake. That is about to change with rumors now confirming that three potential buyers are interested in acquiring ULA. These include a private equity fund, an unidentified aerospace company, and, most intriguingly, Blue Origin. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin eyeing ULA makes strategic sense. Amazon has already committed to 38 ULA launches for its Kuiper satellites. This acquisition could streamline the whole process and save them a lot of money. Moreover, it would instantly provide Blue Origin with an orbital class launch vehicle, meaning that we couldn't joke about them not reaching orbit anymore. The buyer is expected to be announced in the coming months. Depending on the choice, ULA's future could either see massive success with frequent Vulcan launches or a complete downfall caused by bad management. Only time will tell, you got this, Tori! Speaking of time, let's end this episode with a look at Virgin Galactic, a company that is running out of it. Virgin Galactic's journey has been a mixed bag of triumphs and setbacks. This year marked a significant turnaround as the company started flying its passengers on a monthly basis. The latest mission, Galactic 05, took off in early November. VSS Unity soared to an altitude of 87.2 kilometers or 54 miles and safely returned to Earth after 14 minutes and 20 seconds flight with three tourists and three employees on board. With a sixth successful mission in a span of only a few months, things were starting to look optimistic. 
However, a recent announcement paints a different story. Following the Galactic 05 mission, the company plans to reduce its launch frequency to just one per quarter. The 06 mission is slated for January 2024, with 07 to follow three months later. Shockingly, after these two missions, Virgin Galactic plans to stop flying altogether and retire VSS Unity. This pause in operations is part of a cost-cutting strategy that involves moving away from Spaceship 2 and laying off 320 employees. The focus will then shift to developing the Delta-class Spaceship 3 which, according to Virgin, can handle up to 400 launches a year. Virgin Galactic's financial plan targets positive cash flow by 2026. However, it is worth pointing out that currently the company generates a loss of around a million dollars per day. This raises questions about the company's ability to turn a profit, especially since all these losses include the 1,000 tickets they've already sold. So they first have to fly 1,000 people for free and just then they will start making money. The concept of a rocket-powered space plane is undeniably epic and I'd be happy to fly aboard one myself. However, practical operations seem to suggest that we haven't quite reached the point where suborbital space tourism is a sustainable business model. It is just very expensive. Despite these challenges, there is still hope for Virgin Galactic. They may emerge as the dark horse in this sector, eventually revolutionizing the field of suborbital tourism. All we can do for now is keep our fingers crossed and watch their ambitious plans unfold. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Leading to the creation of Megabay. <coughs> and there, my voice was gone. Of Starship. Starship? <laughs> I'm sorry. Come home, home.